Hey guys, it's Corbett Lunsford from the Building Performance Workshop. We're at the Tiny Lab so that we can start talking about on-demand water heat. Now, the first thing that I want you to know is don't let anybody get away with calling it instantaneous water heat, because it's not. In fact, it takes a little longer for me to get hot water out of that thing than it would out of a tank. The reason being that you have pipes. So these two pipes, cold water has to come in, get heated up, and then go out to my shower, my sink, which are the only two things that I've got in the tiny lab. Uh, but in a bigger house, we're gonna have a much bigger problem because we've got more pipes, longer pipes to more different things. And we keep this turned all the way down because we're only gonna be heating a tiny bit of water for just that shower and sink. And I have the water temperature set to a different temperature than you would have in your house because ours is kept at 70. Yours comes in at 55 from the ground. So when you turn on the hot water, the first thing that happens, hit it, is that the fan in the water heater turns on. That's to induce a pressure in the flue to make sure that all of the combustion gases that are about to happen get out. Then the clicking starts, and that's the lighter for the flames. Then the flames start up, and you can see that the water temperature starts. The flames start, and you can see that the water temperature starts rising dramatically from 75, 80, and on and on. Let's look at this in a bigger house. This is a slightly bigger system for a house with two bathrooms and a kitchen. Now, whereas our tiny lab water heater was 75,000 BTUs per hour max, this one is 200,000 BTUs per hour max. We have bigger everything here, bigger flue, bigger pipe system, bigger demand for hot water. Now let's go talk about the details of how exactly this thing works because it might surprise you. So just like any heating, cooling, ventilation system, your hot water system needs to be designed with calculations because we have a certain number of sinks, we have a certain number of bathtubs and showers, and we have a certain amount of behavioral use. And you want all that stuff to make it into the calculation so you know what type of equipment to buy because you just go out and buy a big box that's capable of producing a ton of heat might not be the right thing for you. For example, with one that can produce 200,000 BTUs per hour, the minimum, means that if I use this much hot water, and I would actually like this to be hot, there is no way that this is gonna be hot because my water heater doesn't actually recognize this amount of flow as something that needs to be heated at all. So if I plan on doing this, it's not gonna work. I actually need to get this rolling a lot harder to actually get my water heater to click on. And it goes through the same cycle that I had in the other water heater in the tiny lab. First the combustion venting system kicks on with the fan, then the thing lights up, then it starts heating water. And it's actually not instantaneous at all. Again, exactly the same thing as a tank water heater, except that now you're just heating up the amount of water that you want to be able to use. Now, that's another thing. And of course, since we're always about home performance diagnostics here, we're gonna use some pieces of test equipment. I have my $10 meat thermometer, and I have my $600 FLIR C2 infrared camera. They're gonna tell me the same thing. Both of these are very good investments. This can be used for a lot more stuff. But I can see that my water is about 80 degrees. Again, not instantaneous. And it's actually dropping in temperature because it's having to go through its heating cycle. Now the water heater has finally started to produce hotter water. I'm getting 90, passing 95, passing 100. My infrared is a lot faster because it doesn't have to be calibrated. Passing 110. Now this is where it gets interesting. The reason that a tank water heater is not such a great idea is because I heat a bunch of water for as many things as I could possibly want to use it for. And I'm going to uh, heat all of it to the same very hot temperature so that if I have two showers running at the same time, then both people can have some hot water. And that means that I can turn up my water heater to 120. This water heater is also set to 120, and what I'm actually getting delivered here is 120 degree, honest to God, water. And that means it's so hot that if I was to put my hand under this for just literally seconds, it hurts. That's not the best idea. Um, so also, if I'm using a mix, and let's say that I've got some cold water tuned into this, hit it, and we turn on another hot water demanding appliance in the house, like a bathtub, etc. Now I'm actually having to share just like I would with a tank water heater system because this system has not been designed as well as it should be for the amount of complicated loads that we've got. 
I've dropped five degrees and descending down to 113. So all this to say that just because it's an on-demand system, again, not instantaneous, doesn't make it officially better than having a tank. It is different, and if you use it the right way, and if you design it the right way, then it could serve your family really well in a house or in a rental situation. But don't just go after it because it's this new technology and the box says it's all new and shiny and great tech, you know, a new invention that's going to help you and save you. You wanna make sure to always use your brain, use a local contractor who really knows what they're talking about and knows how to do the calculations and install it the right way. So I hope that this has helped you with your own water heating decisions. I'm Corbett Lunsford. Tune in next time. Watch this trick. God sends us what we beg for.